Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the May 2021 edition of the St. Louis Java Users Group. For those who don't know, the St. Louis Java Users Group is really an informal user group. Uh, attendance is free. We don't have a formal membership list. Our normal meeting date is the second Thursday of every month, except December, uh, when we don't have a meeting. There's just too much going on over the holidays for us to be able to have a meeting. But when we do meet in person, uh, you can join us for food and social at 6 p.m. and the meeting starts at 6.30. When we do meet in person, our normal meeting location is in the Object Computing Incorporated training room at 12,140 Woodcrest Executive Drive, Suite 310 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'd like to introduce you to the other members of the uh, St. Louis Java Users Group Steering Committee. So from left to right, we have Ted Doyle, Todd Simmerman, Bruce Allspaw, that's me in the middle, Wei Chi Gao, and Kathy Swang. And you can reach all of us at the St. Louis Java Users Group Steering Committee if you send an email to that address there that is at the bottom of that slide there. That's Java SIG SC, Java Special Interest Group Steering Committee is what it stands for, at ociweb.com. And then we'll all get that email. The St. Louis Java Users Group would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. So I'd like to thank OCI. They're our founding sponsor. They've been with us uh, since the beginning and they've been providing the training room for when we meet in person as well as filling in uh, whenever we have any gaps or anything like that. They've again, been with us from the beginning and we really appreciate the support we've had over the years. I'd also like to thank Jay Frog, and they're here tonight. Jay Frog has been very kind as far as sponsoring the Zoom subscription so that we can have Zoom meetings here over the web to make this uh, conference possible. And also the meetup subscription fees. Now it's free for you if you'd like to RSVP and attend a meeting, but it does cost the jug a little bit uh, some funding to be able to have a site on the Meetup website. And Jay Frog has been covering that cost for us. And they'll be coming on here shortly. I think they have some announcements too, as well as a wrap. Signature consultants, as well as Adaptive Solutions Group, are headhunters. And so if you're looking for a Java position, uh, they would be good to get in contact with. And when we do meet in person, they will sometimes sponsor the food uh, for the jug. But we haven't figured out how to send pizza over the web yet. JetBrains has been sponsoring. I know you're disappointed over there. I see that disappointment. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I saw that. Anyway, uh, JetBrains has been real good. They have been... Uh, sponsoring JetBrains licenses over the, over the years. So at the end of this meeting, we will be conducting a raffle. So we will have two JetBrains licenses of your choice since those can be sent electronically. Elastic has also been sponsoring some gift cards and we'll be bringing those back again once we're back in person. Intertech is a training company and they sponsor the famous screaming flying monkeys. Now, what in the world are those? They are little monkey dolls where if you throw them up against the wall, uh, they scream. <laughs> and they've got some rubber bands and things like that. And they're actually a lot of fun as well as some coffee cups and some uh, mouse pads and, and the like. But they do have good training. And if you just do a quick Google search, you'll bring up their website and you can see all the training on all kinds of different computer related topics that they have. Manning has been sponsoring ebooks. And so at the end of this program, uh, we will be doing the raffle and we will also be giving away two Manning ebooks. And then Pearson uh, has been sponsoring on occasion 
some physical books for us. So thank you uh, for all of our sponsors. So we've got some presentations that are in development at this time. Uh, one of which is building Java applications for Neo4j. We're trying to see if we can get on to the Quarkus World Tour 2021. Uh, we were on the FUJ World Tour, and we're going to see if we can get on the Quarkus World Tour as well. We're working out the details on that. I was just in contact, finally, with Sebastian Bashner. And he's looking at possibly giving a presentation on developer productivity. That will eventually put us into the fall. And September, as I understand it, is going to be the end of life for Java 16. Java 17, when it comes out, is going to be a long-term support edition, or at least that's my understanding but it's not going to be out till expected sometime in September. And Simon Ritter of Azul Systems says we've had some discussions that he may be able to either give a remote presentation or possibly in person to tell us about the new features of Java 17 uh, once, that, once that's out. Now, it still hasn't been 17, even the pre-release is not out yet, but once that's finalized, I think a lot of people will be interested in that. But the bottom line is, as far as the schedule goes, the way to keep up with it is just watch the Meetup group. That's meetup.com slash gateway chart to keep up with the updates to the presentation schedule and location as to whether or not it's going to be online or in person or some sort of hybrid. Uh, approach as we slowly start coming out of this uh, of this pandemic. Now, if you're interested in giving a presentation or in becoming one of the sponsors of the job, the thing to do is to just email the, the folks on the steering committee at that email address that I gave before. That's javasigsc at ociweb.com. And so before we get to tonight's presentation, on reactive microservices with Spring Boot and Jay Hipster. Uh, I'd like to let uh, Ari here at uh, JFrog talk about the raffle that he's doing and I think some special offers uh, that you have. Ari, you wanna talk about that? Sure, thank you so much, Bruce, I appreciate it. Let me go ahead and share my uh, screen really quick. Uh, okay, cool, I hope everyone can see that. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ari Waller. I am the Meetup Event Manager for JFrog. And again, uh, we are really excited to be part of the St. Louis Jug community. Uh, JFrog is a DevOps software company. We were founded in 2008. And many in the DevOps community and developer community know us by our flagship product, Artifactory, which was, of course, written in Java, thus the J. Um, our annual global DevOps conference, Swamp Up 2021, is coming to the Americas May 26th and 27th. And JFrog wants those in the St. Louis jug to get in for free. Now, the main conference day is free. That's one day. However, for the meetup community, we want to offer two days for free. Um, as you can see, we have some uh, pretty amazing um, content. We have a DevOps CEO panel, which includes the CEOs of HashiCorp, PagerDuty, Datadog, Elastic, and of course, JFrog. Um, and some speakers you may recognize from the Java community, uh, actually Java champions, would include Andres Elmere from Oracle, Guillaume LaForge from Google, and our very own Melissa McKay from JFrog will also um, be speaking at this event. And um, all those who come will have an opportunity to have, bring home a t-shirt like this, um, which uh, I'm a very poor model, uh, but uh, that, but uh, those who know JFrog know that we have the uh, coolest uh, t-shirts in the industry, as the saying goes, if software didn't work out for us, we were definitely going to go into the t-shirt. Yeah, right. But, uh, that, but that being said, we would love for everyone to come, and I'm gonna drop that link if, you, if you're not able to use the QR code um, in the chat. Um, so our raffle for you this evening is, and I'm pretty excited about it, is um, you're going to have an opportunity to win a Google Home Hub. 
Uh, you can enter by using the QR code or the bit.ly that you see. Um, and I'm also gonna drop that in the chat as well. Winners will be selected within two business days because of compliance, I can't do live drawings. However, I will share uh, that the winner is picked randomly and we will also pick and also share the winner uh, with the entire meetup community on your meetup page, as well as uh, through social media. But uh, again, uh, just a real honor to be with you all and really, really excited to hear, uh, hear, hear Matt's talk this evening. So without any further ado, I'm just gonna turn it over to him, Matt. All right, so I hope everyone's ready. I am. You might notice my dress. I'm an old fashioned Java developer. And uh, I have a good friend with me here tonight. Old fashioned Java developers like to drink a little John J. Bowman. So I'm gonna start off with a glass of that just to get in character. Not too much, right? Just a, just a splash. All right. So old fashioned job developer, Matt, is kicking this thing off. Let me uh, get my presentation going here. Oh, I gotta share my screen, right? Share screen, that one. And open this up and play. Now are you seeing the presentation? Because I can't see anything. Can I get a yes? You don't see my speaker notes, right? It looks good to me. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about reactive Java microservices. And this presentation is based on a blog post that I wrote called the same thing, reactive Java microservices. I'm quite proud of it. I wrote it back in January. And I think if you still Google for those three words, I'm in the top two on Google. So that's always fun when you, you know, hit your keywords with a blog post. And you might notice in this graphic, the microservices is kind of a different font. That's Pacifico font. And you might've seen it used on the JHipster website. And now you might be asking yourself, well, what is JHipster? Well, it started out very different from what it is today. It started out, as a way of generating a spring backend and an Angular JS front end. So that was quite some time ago when we were all using Angular JS and appreciating it. Well, then Angular 2 came along and kind of disrupted everything. And basically, JHipster adopted it. We adopted Spring Boot when it came out. And then we adopted all of the other things that developers in our ecosystem tend to like. Docker, Kubernetes, and we became more of a platform. So continuous integration, all that kind of stuff. And now it's almost like a choose your own adventure book, but as a tool. So how to get started with JHipster is pretty simple. It's kind of strange though, because it started out as a way of actually invoking Node from Ant, and then it moved into invoking Node from Maven. But you'll notice my instructions here say, you have to install with NPM. So I realize it's a little backward, but we're trying to make you hip, right? So since these instructions, you'll see you just install it, you create a directory and CD into it, and you run it with jhipster. So one thing you might not be aware of is that take command there. That does a make dir and CDs into it. It's one of my favorite commands. We also have jhipster online, which is similar to start.spring.io and a JDL option, but I'll get to that in a minute. So there's a plethora of different options. I like how you're named the gateway jug because that's what we're going to do today. We're gonna to develop a gateway and then several microservices behind it. But you can also develop a monolith. And that's what I recommend typically. Why develop microservices if you can develop a monolith and get away with it? Spring MEC or Spring Webflux. You can choose your authentication type. You can do good old fashioned authentication with session management. You can do it with JOTs or JWTs, or you can use OAuth and OpenID Connect. The database types, you can do SQL or NoSQL, you know, all kinds of stuff, Build Tool, Maven, or Gradle. Um, and you can even choose React, Vue, or Angular. And so you might be asking yourself, does JHipster provide the paradox of choice? The paradox of choice is like, you get so many options that it's really tough to pick. And I think the difference is when you have too many choices, and too many decisions, 
you have too little time to do what is really important. And that's where JHipster differs because we actually do everything so well that you just pick the options and you go from there. So I mentioned JHipster online. This is what it looks like, start.jhipster.tech. And there's a couple options on the left that you can use without signing in. That's JDL Studio. JDL stands for JHipster Domain Language. That's how we know we're hip is because we have our own domain language. And uh, JHipster Statistics. So if you want to see who chooses which web frameworks or Gradle versus Maven or anything like that, you can uh, see those there. And I did mention JDL. This is kind of what it looks like. It's similar to JSON, but not quite. And it allows you to not only configure applications, but entities and relationships between those. So the first commit ever to JHipster was by Julian Dubois on October 21st, 2013. And the message was hipster, hipster stack for Java developers. Yeoman plus Maven plus Spring plus AngularJS in one handy generator. So that was his commit message. And you might notice Yeoman's in there. So if you haven't heard of Yeoman, it's very popular in the JavaScript community and it's used to scaffold applications, you know, generate the code you might need for an application. And it was pretty cool when JHipster first came out and for the first several years, uh, the command you would have to run to start JHipster would be yo JHipster. And I always thought it was cool. It was like, yo, create me an app, right? That's kind of a cool thing to say. And uh, the first public release was December 7th, 2013. And it's grown a whole lot since then. We had almost 2 million downloads just in 2020 alone. And so just talking about JHipster like this makes me just, you know, I want to change things a little and get a little more hip. So what I did is I, I got my shoes here, right? My Converse. And I'm going to go <laughs> ahead and put those on so I feel a little more hip here. And get those on there and then. And then I took off my slippers, right? Normally I wear nice business shoes, but you know, these days I just got house slippers on. So starting to feel a little more hip. So like I said, my name is Matt Rabel. I, uh, I like to ski, I like to mountain bike. I like to uh, drive Volkswagen. So if you like classic Volkswagens, I'm your guy, let's talk. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity, no running water. I live in Denver, Colorado with my beautiful wife, Trish, and awesome kids, Abby and Jack. You can tell this photo is a couple years old because Jack's the tallest one in the family now. So when your kids get to like 12 or 13, holy cow, the next four years is like, they really grow up fast. I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe. I bought him off eBay in 2004 for 10 grand. Oh Bargain at the time. And uh, it took me 12 years to make him look like this. Uh, part of the problem was I put in a Porsche engine and a Porsche transmission, so he really gets up and goes. You could call him an expensive obsession. The funny thing is I blogged about it the whole time, and I thought it was going to be done in six months, the entire time. So kind of funny to look back on that. I do want to write a book on it someday. I work for Okta. My dad calls it Okra, so it's fine if you mess up the name. We do users as a software service. Acronym for that is UAS, so that's not great. Um, sometimes I say user management as a software service. It's a little better. Um, but we also do OAuth and OpenID Connect as a software service. So that's pretty hip. I, you know, I feel a little more hip talking about that. So I think I'm going to take off my coat here and, and tie and just get a little more comfortable. So this is going to take starting a to like you. Now I'm <laughs> starting to like you more. Right. Nice. So... I used to switch to a bow tie at this point, but you know what? It's really hard to put on a bow tie when you're wearing a tight collar. So I got a little angular shirt here instead. All right. So now let's talk about the history of spring, brief history of spring and microservices. So there's a lot of things that make up a reactive microservices architecture and spring is at the core of it all. So Spring was started in October 2002. That's when Rod Johnson published his J2E design and development book. I actually have a copy on my bookshelf back there. And uh, then 2004, Spring 1.0 came out. And then 2006, everyone was super happy because all of a sudden the XML had namespaces and oh my, it was so much easier to use. 2009 came around and they had Java config and it was cool, but no one really used it. And as time progressed in like 2012, I would say 2013, people started complaining about XML help with Spring and that they had reams of, you know, XML documents. And, you know, sure, it was cool that 
Spring allowed you to configure things in XML, but how often did you really change it, right? So it was like, you're just abstracting into XML. And so what fixed that for the Spring community and kind of brought them back from that was Spring Boot. So that launched in 2014 and then 2015 Spring Cloud came along. And Spring Cloud was basically embracing and wrapping and integrating a lot of the Netflix open source libraries. And Netflix was very successful at doing their microservices implementation. So it kind of brought it to the rest of us developers and allowed us to you know, use Spring and Spring Cloud and develop these microservices that talk to each other and work nicely and it was easy to do. So I do like to give you a little background on microservices because some people get credit and other people don't. And these four definitely get credit with a lot of the uh, literature that I've read. The guy on the top left there is James Lewis, Martin Fowler, and Adrian Cockroft and Joel Wallens down on the right there. And so the first mention of Java, or not really Java microservices, but just microservices as two words, goes all the way back to 2007. And so even though it was mentioned 2007, 2006, around there, it never really got popular until Martin Fowler's blog post on March 25th, 2014. And it was just simply titled microservices. And years later, this is still considered one of the definitive articles for microservices and what defines it. And one of the things he talked about in there was Conway's law. And that an organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure copies the organization's communication structure. So what that means is if you have a company that has UI specialists, middleware specialists, right? Your Java programmers, and then you know your DBAs or your SQL specialists in the back end, it's gonna be really tough for you to build a microservices architecture because you know when you traditionally organize your technology layers this way, um, what happens is the teams try to get stuff done without interacting with the other team. So in the Java developer example, it would be them doing a whole lot of SQL stuff in the Java code. In the DBA example, right, they would write stored procedures instead of, you know, letting the Java developers do it. So a smart team will optimize around this and, you know, choose the lesser of two evils, which is often, you know, doing in the database if you're a DBA or doing in Java if you're a Java developer. So it's an example of Conway's law in action. And what it means is if your communication structure doesn't allow your teams to be, have one of those people on each team, then it's gonna to be tough for you to adopt microservices. So the philosophy of microservices is just, you know, do one thing and do it well. It's easier to work small on one thing and no single program represents a whole application. When I worked at LinkedIn in 2008, the biggest reason that they wanted to adopt a microservices architecture was because they had a weekly release. And so you had to wait for Thursday to get your bug fix in and they wanted to be releasing stuff every day. And so, you know, that's one of the biggest reasons why you might want to adopt microservices is to be able to actually deploy things independently. And so Spring Boot does Java very well. It's become the on off switch of enterprise Java, in my opinion. Everyone's using it, loves it. It configures Spring automatically for you. Uh, it took it so we had these huge POM files and kind of made it so there was just you know, a few dependencies and they auto configured themselves and then it embedded the container and it really just made life a lot easier for Spring developers in particular. And with Spring 2.0, well, first of all, Spring Framework was released, 5.0 was released in September, 2017. So, you know, that's almost four years ago. And it built on Reactor and the Reactive Stream specification and it, it included Spring Web Flux. So this is the first time Spring had like a web framework that supported reactive concepts. And so Spring Boot 2.0 added Spring Web Flux support and it was released March 1st, 2018. So still we're talking, you know, three years ago, it's been around for a while. And a lot of people ask like, what's the difference between Spring MVC and Spring Web Flux? Like, why should I use one over the other? Well, performance differences are negligible unless you're doing a lot of API calls at a scale of at least 500 requests per second. So this is something that you might not need unless you have a whole lot of traffic and you're basically trying to save money on hardware. If your cloud bill for every month is in the millions of dollars and you're using Spring MVC, you know, Spring Web Flux could save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's kind of up to that scale that it really makes a difference. And so let's look at some code to compare. This is Spring MVC code. This is from a, an app that I wrote that I used to monitor my health called 21 points. 
and you'll see it's just how you create a, po a points and points in this app represents uh, you get three points a day. So if you eat well, you get a point. If you don't drink, you get a point. I'm going to lose mine right here. If you exercise, you get a point. So you could get 21 points in a week. I try to get 15 to 18. And you'll see here, this is traditional Spring MVC. It just, you know, talks to a repository that saves it. And then it saves it in Elasticsearch as well with that point search repository. And then it returns, you know, information back to the client that says that all worked. Well, if you look at the Spring Webflux code, it's quite a bit different, right? This is the same app, but we're using Webflux now. And you'll see there's a, a mono that's returned instead of an object. And then there's all this chaining that happens, right? There's the save, the flat map, the map, and all that. And that's because it's reactive programming and you're often doing a fluid way of non-blocking anything, right? So you're not traversing from one line to the next. You're processing something and then doing something else and doing something else. And so it really makes it so you can do high throughput with less hardware. Now, at the same time, it complicates things, right? Because the MVC version was 14 lines of code and this one's 22 lines of code. So a little more complicated, takes a little longer to get your head around. But one of the things that I've noticed is you're kind of getting used to like the streams API in Java. So it's a good thing to learn. It can be useful, especially if you're working with collections. So an API gateway is an essential part of a microservices architecture as is service discovery, right? So you don't talk with IP addresses or hard code IP addresses in your apps. You actually just have, you know, logical names and then someone else figures out the routing. So jhipster had reactive support for microservices clear back in like jhipster 6, but we didn't really have it at the gateway level. So talking about Spring Cloud Gateway, that's super hip. It's been around for a couple of years. People like it a lot. And uh, I wrote a blog post on it. So this graphic is from that. And the, the great story about this graphic in particular is you'll see it's Volkswagen, right? I'm into Volkswagens. I like the classic Volkswagens. And in the blog post, this was embedded. And someone from Volkswagen in Germany contacted me and said, how do you know our architecture? <laughs> and I was like, man, I just made it up. I didn't know you're using something similar to that. So, um, you know, they might have just been joking with me, but they seem serious. So, you know, here we are. Spring Cloud Gateway works pretty well. And what I did with Jay Hipster is I took like a lot of what I learned from writing this blog post and making it all work and integrated Spring Cloud Gateway into Jay Hipster. So, like I said, the microservices were there for, you know, a last year or even two. And then in the last year, we added Spring Cloud Gateway. So the another so thing I want like to mention. A, you cover a little bit of governance or throttling in that gateway at all? You can, but we don't we don't do anything, but there is rate limiting. There's all kinds of things you would need in an API gateway. Spring Cloud Gateway provides that. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think I one of the most it. interesting things that happened that really kind of snuck up on us and we didn't realize we were migrated to Spring Boot 2.3 before Christmas of this year, but Spring 2.4 was out. And so we were like, you know, before we do the 7.0 release, we should upgrade to Spring 2.4. And what we realized by doing that is Spring Cloud deprecated their Zool support, which was previously used for gateways in Spring Cloud before Spring Boot 2.4. And so when we upgraded to Spring Boot 2.4, we could no longer do a non-reactive gateway. It simply wasn't an option that was supported by Spring. And so we had to go reactive. And we discovered that by like CI test failing, being like, hey, this should work. But no, they completely ripped out. You can't use Netflix Zool with Spring Boot 2.4 at all. And so another thing I like to talk about because I am going to demo it is OAuth 2.0 and OIDC. So OAuth 2.0 has been around providing delegated authorization since 2012. And if you're familiar with SAML, SAML has been around since 2006. But SAML was before like cell phones and smart devices and all that. So we get questions all the time because we do provide SAML support as well at Okta about people trying to implement SAML. And what we tell people is, would you implement a SOAP API these days? And most people are like, no, oh, that's, you know, old. And then I'm like, why are you implementing SAML? Like OIDC is to SAML as REST is to SOAP. So, you know, hopefully you don't have to implement SAML. Um, like I said, we do support it. Spring Security supports it, but it's so much easier to work with OAuth and OIDC. So how it works from a login perspective 
is you'll be a resource owner that'll be you and you'll own your data in a third party service. In this example, it's Yelp. And so how Yelp used to work is you would you know, sign up for an account and at the end of your sign up process, it would prompt you to email all your friends, right? And it would have you enter your Gmail username and password and people would do it. And there's no guarantee that Yelp wasn't storing those credentials and using them you know, six months down the road. So they wanted to solve this and give people access to their data without giving apps access to the data. So you know, we have a client, in this case, it's yelp.com, it's an app. We have a resource owner that's uh, the person that's interacting with the app and they wanna to connect to Google. So instead of sending emails to everyone, they actually you know, use OAuth and get authorization to those contacts. So how it works is they'll click on the button It'll go to what's called an authorization server. And that authorization server, if they're already logged in, that's where they get the benefits of single sign-on and they just get redirected back to the app. If they're not, they're prompted to log in. And they'll send a couple parameters like a redirect URI. That gets processed by the authorization server. And if everything works, it sends you back to that app. So you do have to do some work on the authorization server to say, this is a valid redirect URI. And if it's not you know, allowed on that list of URIs, then it won't work. And then you pass in some scopes and then, you know, it requests consent. Do you give Yelp access to your public profile and contacts? It comes back to that redirect URI. And then you can exchange what's called a code for an access token and an ID token. And that's where OpenID comes into effect. OAuth 2 has nothing to do with identity. It's not an authentication protocol. It was never meant to be. And OpenID adds a little bit of you know, authentication on top of that or identity so you know who the user is. And then you can use that access token to get the user's info. That's also a standard endpoint that didn't exist before OpenID Connect and it knows who you are so it can say hi. So that's just like an OAuth overview because we're going to be using that. And then another important part of microservice architectures are Docker and Kubernetes, at least in the Java ecosystem, it might be different in other ones. I'm not gonna go into that much, but I will show them in the demo and jhipster supports them both. So you can generate Docker files. It leverages Docker for running like databases and for running Keycloak for OAuth. And you can generate all of the YAML files you need for Kubernetes, which is nice because writing YAML ain't no fun. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do a demo. And this is always tricky because I have this 38 inch monitor and I got to unmirror and hope everything works out. And then Zoom, right, is recording everything. And, uh, and there's just a lot going on with JHipster and all the containers we're going to start up. So it should, uh, should be a good time here. So we'll uh, probably have to mirror our screens here. So let me see if I can find that. Displays, arrangement, mirror. Okay, so we're still seeing the same stuff, right? And uh, first of all, jhipster.tech is a website if you wanna go there and you know learn more. Uh, this blog post is on the Okta developer blog and you'll notice if you scroll down a bit, then there is a repository here. So I've already Black opened screen. up this repository. What's Black that? Screen. Black screen. You don't see anything, huh? Let me try unsharing and resharing. There it is. Now you see it? Yep. All right. So like I said, jhipster.tech, the blog post, and the source code is in this repo. So I have this repo open here, and I have a demo.adoc that I'm going to use. Now, just so you're aware, this repo has a number of different examples. There's jhipster non-reactive. This reactive jhipster is the one we're going over today. And then if you just want to see Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, or Spring Cloud Gateway, those are also available. So there's a demo.adoc uh, demo script that I like to use here. It's written in ASCII doc, so it's easy to read. And I'll put that up on the left here. And you'll see we need Java 11, Node 14, and Docker. So I'll put that one on the right and make sure we have Java 11. Yep, and Node 14, just updated that today. And then Docker PS, make sure nothing's running. And I also want to make you aware of Docker by default only has about two gigs of memory allocated and that is not enough to start everything like some of your microservices won't start. So I've actually got it bumped up to like 10 CPUs and 20 gigs. This is a MacBook Pro with 64 gigs of RAM. So pretty lucky in that sense. 
Um, I've pulled it off with less, but you want to tweak those or things just won't start and you'll be unhappy. So we're going to build a reactive microservices architecture. Um, we have jhipster installed, so you can do jhipster version and should be 7.0.1, the latest version. If you don't have it installed, you can install it using this. And what we'll have is a JDL. So JDL is jhipster domain language. And this is our gateway here. It's gonna be reactive. And even if you change this to false, we would force the, reactive, the gateway to be reactive because of that Spring Cloud problem I talked about. And then we set the package name. And if I don't have anything in here, it'll actually choose the default. So if I didn't have Postgres, for instance, uh, Postgres is the default, so I could remove that line. If I didn't have the client framework of view, I could delete that and it would use Angular, right? And if I didn't have the build tool, it would use Maven. So we're using authentication of OAuth 2. You have to have that in all of your microservices or they can't talk to each other. You can't like mix with session-based and job-based and all that. And then Cypress will use for testing the UI. And then we have these entities, a blog, a post, a tag, and a product. So that is for the UI. It's gonna generate the UI for that on the gateway. And then we have a blog application that's gonna use Neo4j and it's gonna use service discovery of Eureka. And they all use Eureka, right, to talk to each other. And then there's also MongoDB for a store app that's just gonna have a single product in it. And then you can see the entities here. There's a blog with a name and a handle and some validation rules. There's an entity of a post and a tag, typical blog, you know, architecture. And then a product just has a title, price, and an image. And we have some relationships. If you use JPA and their annotations, like those aren't always that intuitive. I think this is a little easier, but maybe just because I've used JHipster for five years, we have relationship of many to one, a blog and user in that blog and the login field in that. So this is to specify like what's in the dropdown kind of thing. So a blog can have many, you know, user can have many blogs, a post can have, or a blog can have many posts and then many to many, a post can have many tags. And then some pagination rules for, you know, infinite scroll or, you know, little links for one, two, three. And then these are to indicate that those are microservices and how to relate the entities to them. And then this is for Docker Compose. So that's all in there. The cool part is we also have this JDL samples repository. So if you were to go and look at it, it's got a whole bunch of files in there for all the different things. And it actually has this one in here. So one of the things we added recently was you can actually just type uh, jhipster JDL in whatever name it is, and it'll look it up in that samples repo. So first of all, we need to create a directory. We'll call this reactive stack. So take reactive stack, and then you can do jhipster JDL reactive MS. And so you'll see in this example, I did .jdl. Well, that's because I copy the file locally, but if I'm pulling it from the uh, GitHub repo, I don't need to. And what this will do is it'll actually generate all the projects in parallel and it'll generate some Docker compose files for you. So the Docker compose files, like I said, allow you to run databases in Docker, the jhipster registry, which the jhipster registry has Eureka server from Spring Cloud. So it does service discovery and allows all the apps to register with each other. Keycloak for identity and for OAuth and you can run it all with Docker. So while that's uh, generating, I can start starting some of these Docker containers up. So I'll go into the gateway directory. And if you do ls source main Docker, you'll see which files are in there. There's uh, the app itself. So if you build a Docker container for the app, you can run that app.yml. There's jhipster control center, which is from the EPON folks that allows you to manage multiple instances of jhipster from one central app. jhipster registry, which we talked about, and uh, Keycloak monitoring for Prometheus and Postgres. So those are the ones that we generated for this app. In the central server config is also a Spring Cloud configuration that can be shared across all the apps. So I'm gonna start by starting up Keycloak and you'll be like, what is that shortcut? Well, that is one that's provided by jhipster for the OhMyZSH project. So I have OhMyZSH and what it allows you to do is just have shortcuts for starting all the containers and shutting them down. So. Um, that's why it's, it's that way. You can see if you don't have it installed, this is what it looks like down here where you're, you know, Docker compose and you're pointing to that keycloak.yml file. The dash D says run it as a daemon. If you don't pass that in, then you actually get it right in your console. And so now we need to start uh, Postgres. And then we'll start up uh, the jhipster registry. 
So for your key cloak, the YAML that you showed, is your configuration in there as well for users, groups, and all that kind of stuff? Uh, it's an excellent question. So if we look at uh, the key cloak file, it's just VI at source main key or Docker key cloak. Um, what it does is it pulls from this uh, realm config. And so we actually have those files loaded up um, and they're in this directory. So if you look at source main Docker realm config, that's where they are. That's the realm. So it has the apps in there that it registers for jhipster and then the users as well. So when you type in admin admin, it actually logs in. So um, when we do switch to like Okta, we have to configure it with all those things. You have to configure groups. You have to configure the group's claim. So it comes back in the ID token and you have to set up the app itself with the correct redirect. So uh, that's why we like Keycloak is we can run it all in this Docker container and we can pre-configure it. So it has everything that jhipster expects. So that's all that stuff is on your GitHub, right? Um, well, everything's there when you just generate a project. Yeah, and then it's in the, the jhipster project as well on GitHub. So if you want to, you know, go well, and tweak it about the key it. cloak and the configuration for that. Yeah, it's, it's part cloak. of jhipster. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And so you'll see that the thing that's taking the longest here is uh, the gateway, and that's because that's where the UI sits. And so it's doing an NPM install. It's got all kinds of dependencies for Angular. And many of you probably know if you've worked with NPM install, like, it's funny that Java is now faster than JavaScript, you know, for this step in particular. Like you compile Java code, it happens pretty fast. You compile TypeScript to JavaScript, that's kind of slow. So it's uh, it's kind of changed things in the last few years. It's interesting, I would say. Um, but I can start up some other Docker containers. So the blog has a Neo4j container. So I can do uh, JH Neo4j up, oh, start that one. And then if I go into the store directory after this one's done, I'll start up uh, MongoDB as well. Store and JH Mongo. Okay, so we got all the Docker containers running. Um, this is always the riskiest thing to do on stage is an NPM install. So, you know, that's why I got some John J. Bowman to tide my way. Oh, I also wanted to mention, so this, part right here is very important when you're running everything in Docker. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna run just those you know, backend services in Docker and we're gonna run all the apps with Gradle. But then at some point we're gonna package it all up and run it with Docker Compose. And in that case, Docker makes it so you can talk to between containers with like just a, a host name essentially. But because ClickCloak redirects in a browser to you, the end user, it needs to have a URL in there that it understands. So we do require that you, in your Etsy host file, put in, you know, key cloak pointing to 127001. And we haven't found a better solution than that. So we'd love one. We don't want people to, you know, have to modify a host file to make jhipster work when running locally, but um, that's how it is right now. So you don't need it unless you're running everything in Docker Compose. And we can start starting these up. So the store you know, is generated, so we can run that one. And then we can have the blog in another window here. And while I'm starting these, feel free to ask any questions if you have any. It's funny, I was using StreamYard last night to do the Denver Jug meetup. And what I noticed with StreamYard, I don't think Zoom's quite as bad, but it does you know, tend to slow things down a lot. With StreamYard, I wasn't even doing anything. I just had Chrome up and I was just you know, the host that was you know, adding and removing people and sharing screens and stuff like that. And it used up so much memory that I couldn't open up another browser like Firefox or even Safari and load a web page in under a minute. So um, you know, this is kind of the, the nature of remote as we thought it was really cool that we could do these and uh, everything would work, but turns out our our computers aren't quite powerful enough to like broadcast and record and all this stuff at the same time. So uh, it's always funny when, when these happen because like this gateway process here where it's installing that, that normally takes probably a minute or two and it feels like it's taken like five minutes so far. So it'll print out how long it takes here in the end. And uh, you know, these ones are, are taking quite some time too. So that's why I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but I can also talk about another thing. So 
one of the interesting p- parts of JHipster is, you know, like I said, we're doing the microservices. They're just Spring Boot apps in the back end. They don't have much code in them as far as front end code, right? It's all back end code. And then the UI itself is in the gateway. And so the gateway is actually a monolith for the UI. So it's almost like an anti-pattern because the whole point of microservices is you should be able to deploy them independently. So in this case, if you were to modify the store microservice and you change some fields or deleted or added some fields, you would need to modify that view front end, right? To be aware of those fields and actually use them. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that we're not quite doing great because you know we actually make you do that way. So you'll see, uh, it looks like the JHipster registry wasn't quite up yet. So let's look at Docker and see what it says there. Um, but we are working on that. So micro front ends, we were waiting for uh, Angular 12, which came out today or yesterday. And so now that Angular 12 is out, we can, uh, we can probably use that. So JH registry up. And the cool thing about uh, Reactive in particular, one thing I've noticed is normally like if something's not up like MongoDB or Neo4j or in this case, JHipster registry, like the app fails to start, right? It can't connect to the database, it's done. Well, with Reactive, a lot of times it'll reconnect when it's available. So, you know, we'll see if these actually work, but, you know, there's a good chance that even though the registry wasn't available, when it becomes available, they'll be able to connect they'll be able to, you know, do everything as normal. So I think that's one of the cool features of Reactive. But yeah, these are going on, what, three minutes each? Usually takes 30 seconds to a minute. And this NPM install up here. Well, we got some moderate vulnerabilities. I'm gonna blame Angular for that, but we're not using Angular, we're using Vue, so who knows, some things in Vue. But we're close, right? And it's sponsored with love by Octodev. We're a platinum sponsor. And uh, now it's generating the Docker file. So that's like nine minutes. Wow, I'm glad you stuck around and hopefully none of you all <laughs> dropped off while that was happening. So I can uh, go into the gateway now and I can run Gradle. to start up the gateway, our backends, you'll see they connected to JHipster registry. So I didn't mean that to be part of the demo, but it's pretty cool that you know the app doesn't fail if it's backend services or whatever it depends on is you know unavailable. But now, <laughs> boy, starting this, uh, this front end might take a little while. So one of the things that JHipster does, it's kind of weird. I've always argued against it, especially for demos like this, but uh, we did an NPM install when the gateway was first created, right? And we waited almost nine minutes for that. Well, Gradle also does an NPM install and it only does it once, right? But it doesn't recognize the first one we did. So it's, it's kind of a pain here because it's actually doing it again. Now, the cool thing is Gradle's smart enough that it won't do it again. It won't even build the UI unless you change some code in the UI. So um, it's nice that way. We did have to actually, for the Maven version, we had to actually use Ant to detect if uh, if the files had changed or not. So that's well, a good use of the Maven Ant plugin, but it's also kind of interesting that Gradle does it better. And uh, it's, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, I like to demo it, but this is a painful part, especially on Zoom. So let's uh, let's look down at some other stuff and and see what we got going on here. So um, one thing you could do, right, in, in this window here is in the gateways, you could run npm run e2e, and that would fire up Cypress and run it. And that takes about a minute to run normally, but based on the speeds I'm seeing here, I think it could take like five minutes to run. So I'm not gonna run that, but it will go and test all of the microservices, right? Because they all have UIs and uh, it generated all the entities, it created CRUD for those entities. so. It's a pretty cool system. And we used to use Protractor. And I don't know if you saw this, but Angular actually deprecated Protractor. Like if you create a new Angular 12 app and you try to run NPM run E2E, it's not there. It doesn't exist anymore. And so they're like deprecating the whole project. And the reason that Jay Hipster moved from using Protractor to using Cypress is we had so many false positives in our CI. Like instead stuff was failing, we'd pull it down, we'd try it locally and it wouldn't work. And so it was just frustrating for us to be like, is this a protractor issue or is this a J hipster issue? And so since moving to Cypress, we've seen much less false positive. We've seen much more robust, like, you know, tests and uh, things are just working a lot better. So we're big fans of Cypress. Uh, funny note though, they did between like their late six version and their early seven version, they completely broke it. So instead of taking five minutes, it would have taken me 10. So they did fix it in like the latest version that came out this week. So if you're using Cypress, 
you know, don't use 7.0, make sure you're using 7.2 or something like that. Um, but we're close. It's almost started up here. Uh, the back end ones are running and uh, things are looking good. So I can actually show the app running. And then because of this, I might not run everything in Docker because <laughs> that might be kind of painful for y'all to wait for that to happen. So uh, here's what it looks like. And this avatar, this character will change based on your application name. So I should have picked a better application, but gateway it is, and that's the guy you get. So if we click sign on, we're redirected to Keycloak here, and we can type in admin, admin, or user, user, uh, depending on which role you want. It comes back, we're logged in, and now you can see we have entities, so we can see our products, and I could create a new one. Uh, we like whiskey or beer. All right, no need for whiskey. I like Belgian beer, because you know it's expensive and 10%. And uh, we can click that and uh, go to our pictures here and upload a picture. And you'll see it saves in the database. That's a notification from view. And then let's look at our blogs. Looks like uh, we can create a new one for like the admin. So admins blog, just call it admin and the user. So that's all working. And then there's some other features in here like uh, the gateway routes and the uh, metrics for the project. So we use micrometer to do all the timings of all the different requests. And you can see we already had 27, 200 requests and, uh, you know, gets for everything else. And then some cache and data source statistics once, you know, things are warmed up. And then there's also help of all the different things, the config server here, you can see the details of it if you want. And uh, the directory composite, your disk space, looks like I got, you know, 142 gigs free and uh, all that kind of stuff. And then even swagger. So if you wanted to look at, you know, the Swagger configuration, you could go down to, you know, look at the users, for instance, and uh, there's only one so far, but you could execute it and you'll see it shows you the curl command and then, you know, that one user that came back. So that's uh, JHipster, you know, running with microservices and they're all reactive. So we can put this on the left. The cool thing is Spring Cloud Gateway actually makes it very easy to relay access tokens to those microservices. So those microservices are set up as OAuth 2 resource servers, much like the example where I showed you're talking to Google contacts to get your Google contacts. Um, the store and the product, you know, the store and the blog microservice are just APIs. And this is all it takes for Spring Cloud Gateway to relay the access token that it got when you logged in downstream to those other, you know, application servers. So that's pretty slick. And what we can do now is we can configure it so it works with Okta. So in this gateway here, we can use the Okta CLI. So if you don't have it, you can get Okta CLI or CLI.Okta.com. And I already have an account, so I don't need to do Okta register. I can just do Okta apps create jhipster. So we have built-in support for jhipster. It'll prompt me for the name. So I'll say St. Louis jug like that. And then it'll prompt me for the redirect URIs, right? We talked about that. So this one right here, is a standard like spring security redirect URI. The only difference is they would expect you to put Okta at the end here. The reason we don't do that is we allow you to switch between Keycloak and Okta or Auth0 or you know, someone else. So we try to be agnostic with that particular name. And so that's what we use for, it's already coded into jhipster. And then this here is for the jhipster registry. And so what that'll allow us to do is actually go and look at the jhipster registry and you know, see what that looks like and uh, log in with OAuth. So we'll just accept the defaults there and then the post logout redirect URIs as well. So it configures a new OIDC application for us. It spits out that client ID, it adds a groups claim. And if these groups didn't exist, it actually created them. So it looks like it created everything. I did create an account recently, but um, you know, if you already had it, it would just say, you know, I already found this, so no worries. And it wrote it to this file right here. So if we were to cat that file, you can see we have an issuer, we have a client ID and a client secret. So what I wanna do is I could configure each individual app to have those values. I could run source on this octa.env file and then it would configure them. But I like to use Spring Cloud Config for this. So um, in the gateway, um, because we're running it with the jhipster registry with Docker Compose, this file right here has the information that we can add. So um, I'll just exit one of these here. And uh, we'll go into the gateway or right at the root and then we'll bi that file. 
and then we'll add this configuration here. So this is a painful part while you watch me copy and paste. Well, if I had left that eye in there, that would kill everything. So we have the issuer here. And then we have the client ID. And the client secret. Never check your secrets into source control. That's why we create that env file and we expect you to ignore it. Now I'm editing a yaml file. So in this particular example, I'm sorry, uh, I, uh, I'm showing you a bad practice, but the good news is I finished a blog post this week where I show you how to use Kubernetes and deploy all this and use Kubernetes secrets and sealed secrets. So you can actually store like your code in GitHub and it's all encrypted. So um, now we can JH registry stop, right? Because we changed everything. So um, we don't want, we need to refresh it. So it picks up that new config. And there is a way to configure a uh, Spring Cloud config to allow you to hit it and refresh without restarting. Uh, we do have a blog post about that. I just didn't do it this one. And this, this error right here is to be expected. No big deal. Um, so then we do JH registry up. And then I will start this one again with Gradle. And then the blog, Gradle and store. And then if you want to run this with Cypress, uh, we expect by default to have uh, the username and password to be admin admin. We test it as if you were an admin user. So if you're switching to Okta, you'll have to you know, override those and put in your Okta credentials and then you can run npm run e2e and everything should work. I tested it this morning everything works. And what I'm going to do is because, you know, we've been going for almost 45 minutes here, this part about Docker images, I'll just walk you through, like talk you through it and, uh, and not show it to you because that might take a little while. Um, and there's another cool shortcut here. So if we were to go into the gateway directory, as soon as that comes up, uh, gateway, you can do JH registry logs and see if that sucker started up because I did see some errors that I couldn't talk to it. So just started, just finished starting. We'll put that one down there. The cool thing is because it's reactive, it will still start and just register later. If you were doing the Spring MVC version, it wouldn't, right? It wouldn't be able to connect. It would just fail to start and you'd have to restart it. So we are using the latest version of Spring Boot. You see 244, I think 245 did come out recently. Um, and we will migrate to Spring 2.5 when it comes out, right in the next month or so. So now that that's running, we can do a new incognito window. And I can show you the jhipster registry first, since that is kind of like the uh, Spring Eureka server. It's going to redirect us to Okta to log in. And this is the hard part. If I don't remember my username and password, then the whole demo fails. Come on. Looks good. All right, so now we're logged in and you can see all our instances are up, right? Our blog, our gateway, our store. It's got some information here about, you know, what we're using and how things are going. And uh, you can see all the instances. You can also see the cloud configuration. So what we put in there, right, is printed out right here. And this feature um, is encryption, right? So if I were to put things in there, um, it would allow me to encrypt it if I configured uh, Spring or JHipster registry with an encrypt key. So like I said, I just finished a draft of a blog post that'll show you how to do that, but I don't have it for you today. Um, but if we go to 8080 and try signing in, oh, that was weird. Let's try it in a new incognito. I don't know why that one didn't pick it up. So this is the gateway, sign in. Hmm. Okay, the gateway needs to be restarted. Maybe that's what happened when it couldn't connect. I, I won't hold you too long if this doesn't work, but um, maybe because it couldn't connect to the registry, it didn't get that new configuration. Obviously the registry did, right? So that seems good. And uh, it shouldn't do this NPM install long because Gradle detects that it's already installed. Of course, it's gonna fail for me now, but that's why I have whiskey here. Come on, baby. Funny story, while I got here, 
So when I first did a similar demo at DevOps UK, um, I noticed that it took me, you know, I'm just using a projector, so it's not Zoom, it's not consuming all kinds of resources. I was, uh, I was on an older MacBook Pro, I think that had 16 gigs of RAM. And it took me like 10 minutes to generate everything, right? And today it took me nine minutes, so similar. Um, but then I was hanging out with some J Hipster folks at J Hipster Conf, and I noticed it took one minute for them to generate the same things that was taking me 10 minutes, and they had older laptops. So it turns out the reason that that was happening is because Okta had security software on my laptop and scanned any new files that I was you know, installing. So NPM install, like you think Maven's bad, right? Maven downloads the internet, NPM install downloads the internet and all its friends. So it was, uh, it was a bad experience. I got them to remove that. So now it's much easier to, uh, to log in and do all that. So this should go to Okta now, it does. And we'll put in my credentials. And unfortunately, I don't get to show you the cool part where I logged into the registry and then I logged into J Hipster and it all worked, but it's got my username and password and all that down there. And if we were to go back to the registry now, we wouldn't have to log in again, right? Because it's all single sign-on. So as long as that session exists on Okta, it'll allow you to log in to all your services. So I will stop these now that we got everything working because you know the Docker version isn't a whole lot different. I'll just walk you through it. So. You know, we don't uh, we don't spend 20 minutes just watching my thing start up. So first of all, you want to, you know, stop all your Docker containers. So if we were to look at this one up here, Docker PS, you can see we still have the registry, Mongo, all that running. So we do want to stop those just to, uh, you know, not consume resources. And then what you'll do is you will use Jib, which is a project from Google, to build the actual Docker container for each app. And you'll notice here it does use the prod profile and even how we were running it before it was using the prod profile. The, the way you know is we use Liquibase to generate your database schemas for you. And we also use a project called Faker.js. And so Faker.js, when you're running in a dev profile, will insert mock data or fake data into the database so you can play around with it and you don't have to enter it. And the prod profile doesn't do that. So when I was navigating around those entities and there wasn't any data in there, that's how you know it was prod. If it was dev, you would have seen all kinds of data in there. And so the main difference here is instead of configuring, you know, the J Hipster registry in the gateway project, you'll configure it in this Docker compose uh, directory. And so that's your application config, and then it'll share it between all your different containers and you can run Docker compose up. So now I'll, uh, I'll do the hard part of going back to my presentation and unmirroring things and hope it all works. Let me know if you see a black screen again, because I won't know. Is it working? Are you seeing stuff? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, it looks good. All right. So if you want to dig into the nitty gritty details of how Spring Cloud Gateway works and how it talks to those microservices and how OAuth works, this blog post has a bare bones example, right? It doesn't have J Hipster or an Angular UI or anything like that. So I'd recommend checking that out just to learn a bit more about Spring Cloud Gateway. It's very slick as a product. I've noticed that VMware is now has a commercial version of it. So they're really betting on that. And I think it was, you know, a good idea. So, you know, I'm feeling super hip since most of that demo worked. So I'll put on my glasses here. And then, you know, you've learned about microservices and how if your organization doesn't actually, you know, have teams that can develop a product from scratch and deploy production and maintain it, it might be very difficult for you to adopt microservices. And even Martin Fowler's recommendation in his definitive article from 2014 says, don't do microservices if you, if you don't need to, because, you know, a lot of it's about scaling people, not so much technology. When I worked at LinkedIn in 2008, we had tons of traffic and our uh, monoliths scaled just fine. And, you know, they really broke it up and started to use microservices because they had so many engineers. And in fact, that's why Java continues to thrive so much. That's why companies switch to Java is because if they do it in Ruby or they do it in Scala, at some point, if they're growing exponentially, they can't hire any developers that know those languages, but there's tons of Java developers out there. So microservices, even though it helps companies scale, it helps 
developers scale almost more than companies because then they can develop and deploy things independently. We learned about Spring Cloud that's, uh, that's super important for the Spring ecosystem and microservices. We used Netflix Eureka for that service discovery. That's what JHipster Registry encapsulated. We also used the Spring Cloud config server so you can distribute config to all your various microservices. And then you saw the Octa CLI made it very easy to actually you know, create a new app and if you wanted to create a new account, you do Okta register and that all works. So again, the blog post is up on the Okta developer blog there. And I just published a screencast today that has this same demo, except it includes a Docker part at the end that I didn't actually want to dare to do. So go ahead and check that out. I you know, edited a lot. So it's, it's down to 20 minutes for the demo. If you like that, you might be asking about Kotlin, like, you know, Java is cool, but what about Kotlin? That seems to be even more hip. And the cool thing is we actually do have a blueprint for Kotlin. So if you install this plugin npm install generator jhipster Kotlin, instead of typing jhipster, you can type khipster. And then it'll generate the whole backend and all the Java code in Kotlin instead. And so since I'm mentioning it, blueprints are a cool concept that we introduced a couple of years ago. And, and they're kind of like plugins, but they allow you to override the defaults. So at first, the view support was a blueprint. So you install the view blueprint and then you run jhipster dash dash blueprints view and it would use you know, view instead of Angular or React. And we have blueprints for all kinds of things. We have blueprints for Quarkus. We have blueprints for Micronaut. We have blueprints for Nest.js, so a Node.js backend. And we have blueprints for .NET Core. So it's really grown beyond the J in jhipster, but we still like the name jhipster, so we keep it. Um, and you might be asking, like, should I go reactive? And a lot of what I think about that is, are you developing CRUD apps? If you are, you're probably not dealing with, you know, streaming data or 500 requests per second. So you probably don't need it. If you're dealing with massive amounts of data and millions of customers, then yeah, it could save you lots of dollars on your cloud bill. So, you know, take a look at Spring Web Flux for that. Um, the reason for this slide is in this picture is because it's a loom. And Project Loom is looming on the horizon. So what the inventors or the people that work on Project Loom claim is it will allow you to write regular non-reactive code. So that's Spring MVC that performs as good as reactive frameworks. And that's like, you know, Akka and everyone's been embracing reactive. So it's a, it's a pretty tall thing to say. I'm not sure if they'll be able to do it. I don't think it's coming in 17. Um, I think there's an early access release you can download, but it's a great concept. Like if we didn't have to learn reactive and we could still get the performance of reactive, I love that idea. But I'm betting on reactive for now because it's here. And I think it's a good skill to have for Java developers to know the streams and how they work and flat map and all that kind of stuff. So what's next for jhipster? Oh, I got another cool thing. So we'll see how to do this. I got to I got a green screen, so I'm gonna kill the green screen if I can figure out how it zoom. Take out my background, and I got a, a hipster background for you. So instead of doing this, we'll say none, right? You can see my green screen now. And then I'm gonna drop it. Come on, baby, go. And I got like a hipster background. I think so. I can't see it, but maybe you can. Can I pick on you for a fundamental question? Yeah. I want you to now, because I trust you so much, characterize the difference between creating a service and a microservice. And what does that really mean to you? They're the same thing, I believe. To me, no. Uh because a RESTful service is not necessarily a microservice because a microservice is supposed to be loosely coupled and people are creating monoliths in this area where they're going back to the exact same data source. And therefore, if you're not creating independently, loosely coupled, equally independently testable solutions as microservices, all you're doing is creating services that could ultimately build into a monolith. Right. And so, so that's a great way to describe it. It basically means that whatever you're developing, if you're calling it a microservice, it has to be able to be independently deployed 
regardless of everything else is one way I would put it. And that's why, even though all this stuff is cool at J hipster, the fact that the UI is all in the gateway makes it so it's not that great. Because if you modify any of the backends that have changes for the UI, you're going to have to redeploy the gateway. And so oh, that's I'm why I think we see your solution that you presented today. I, I really love what you showed. And, and I, I'm, that's not my point because the fact that I've been following you on other uh, things that you've posted and therefore I wanted to just voice my thoughts to you. No, I think it's, it's a great thing because like, yeah, people couple on the database a lot and they're like, we, well, you can deploy them independently, but they're still talking to the same database. So, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> that's coupling. And it's interesting because microservices in the last couple of years has actually had kind of a backlash. It was, I think it started before COVID and it was a lot of, you know, practitioners and stuff saying like, it's resume driven development. People want to learn microservices so they can develop them, but they don't need them. Right. And the company can get away with a monolith and it's much easier to develop. So for me personally, I think it's more of like scaling developers, not technology. I think the technology is good enough that you could, you know, cluster everything with Redis and spring session and even use session based stuff. And you could probably scale to millions of users, but you know, scaling your developers so they can deploy independently as teams is, is the real thing that I think microservices is, is good at. But again, it's not, these are all independent apps, right? They aren't really microservices. There's, they're still apps. And so uh, it's, it's definitely a buzzword. Thank you. You're so not, what's next? You're in prison. Go ahead. Pre presenter notes view and not presentation view. So we see your presentation notes, the clock, and the next slide coming up. All right. Like you saw that I could uh, I could either pick my hat or I could drop my green screen. So let's let's try it here. We'll share this one again and make sure we're on this one and then share and then play. All right, you got the right stuff now? Yep. Yep, All right, so Spring Boot 2.5 is right around the corner. Um, so we'll be upgrading to that. All the blueprints I mentioned, like Corcus and Micronaut, th those are all independent of the main JHipster project. So they're still upgrading to JHipster 7 and they're allowed to evolve however they want. The advantage that they'll get from upgrading to JHipster 7 is the UI, right? The Angular 12, the uh, React 17, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, that's their main motivation for upgrading because they do all the back end themselves, right? They're not really worried about Spring Boot. Uh, the micro front ends, we have a lot of code for that. There's actually one of uh, the main Yeoman people works on the J Hipster project. So he's super efficient with JavaScript. And I think he was just waiting for Angular 12 to come out yesterday. I've seen a bunch of commits from him today. So that could even happen, you know, as early as next week. Who knows? Um, and GraphQL, I think, is very interesting for a lot of people now. I answered an issue for GraphQL because I was personally interested in it a couple of years ago and uh, it got closed because no one was willing to do the work. Um, but we do get a fair amount of comments on it. People are like, hey, I'm interested, but no one's really volunteered. It's mostly on this slide because it's something that I'm interested in, but I also realize that I need to do the work for it. Um, the cool thing is Netflix just released a distributed GraphQL library for Spring Boot. They just added WebFlux support like this week so by waiting, it actually might have benefited because there's there's several libraries out there for Spring Data and Spring Boot to do GraphQL, but it's never been a core part of Spring, and I don't think they want it to be. Um, but you know, now that Netflix, a big company with lots of open source resources, is doing it, like that's pretty neat. Um, one of the things I definitely recommend is you don't have to use it on a project to learn from its source. Before I even you know, started really getting into it, I would generate projects with it just to see how they were doing their Angular to Spring Boot communication, how they're, you know, carrying a CSRF token between, you know, the client and the server, um, how they were doing their OAuth implementation, all that. And it's funny, when I started investigating their OAuth implementation, what I found is it was all done on the client and the client secret was stored in JavaScript. So, you know, I didn't know much about OAuth at the time, but I knew that was a bad idea. So, that's why we revamped it. Everything happens on the server side as far as the OAuth dance. And the reason we don't do it on the client side is because, well, first of all, we'd have to implement it in each client. So that's kind of a pain. And we don't even know if like Vue has an OIDC library. And 
it's less secure because you're storing the access token on the client. So doing it all on the back end with Spring works well. If you want to scale, if you're worried about that, you can use Spring Session and Redis. Uh, we have a blog post about that as well. So feel free to use it as knowledge just to, uh, you know, tune up on the latest technologies that are being used, see how to use Elasticsearch with Spring Boot or something like that. I also wrote a JHipster mini book. Um, it's available from InfoQ. It's way out of date. You don't want to go download it. I just had the slide in here, so I had to talk about it. But I developed a real world app for that 21 points, which I use uh, to monitor my health. Like Spring Boot has Actuator. I have 21 points. And uh, I will start updating that for JHipster 7 soon. So, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter for more information on that. Uh, if you want to learn more about Spring Boot, check out their guides. I really like how they update their guides and they have like hundreds of guides for every release. So if there's a new, you know, 2.4.6 that comes out tomorrow, if you go to their docs, it's all updated for 2.4.6. So I really admire what they've done there. Our site is at jhipster.tech. You can learn about Okta's APIs at developer.okta.com. And the lead developer on my team is Stack Overflow. I say that because most of my career, I was an independent consultant and I never worked with teams a whole lot. I was usually, you know, Lone Ranger. And so uh, Stack Overflow is great. And that's what JHipster uses for most of our support. So if you went and had a question and you entered a GitHub issue, chances are someone would close it and be like, ask on Stack Overflow. So ask your questions on Stack Overflow with the JHipster tag. All the team gets notifications. So we'll know when that happens. Uh, we have lots of tutorials on off with Spring Boot, Angular, Progressive Web Apps, React, Ionic, and JHipster on our blog. And we have that handy OctaDev handle on GitHub, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, Facebook, all over the place. So my action to you is to try JHipster 7. You can see how to install it there with NPM. And uh, if you want to see the source code for this presentation, it's up there on uh, GitHub. And we did recently rename our GitHub org from Okta Developer to Okta Dev, but all the, the links should still redirect. The, the funny story is our whole motivation for renaming was because we had that sponsor message that says sponsored with love by Okta Dev in the uh, J Hipster output. And people were putting that into issues. And the person that had that Okta Dev account was getting spammed. So I went and looked into it and they hadn't used it in years. So I just asked GitHub if we could have it. And as soon as we proved that we are OctaDev, then they gave it to us. So that's kind of neat. Thank you, GitHub. So if you want to keep in touch, my website's at rabeldesigns.com. I'm on Twitter at mrabel. This presentation should be on Speaker Deck right now. If you go to speakerdeck.com mrabel, I use their scheduling feature and I scheduled it to publish an hour ago. So hopefully that worked. And uh, all the code that I typically publish is on GitHub there at OctaDev, and may the auth be with you. So I have, I have one more trick up my sleeve, and that is, you know, no more whiskey, but good Belgian beer. So a Rochefort 10, if you're familiar with good Belgian beer, well, this is one of the best. So questions, anyone got any questions? Besides the ones already asked, of course. So to get to the recordings, you already posted that, right? I came in late. To the recording of this or the recording of something else? This class. Yeah, th this is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube uh, today or tomorrow or something like that, right, Bruce? Okay. Yeah, as soon as I can get it, uh, I'll just post a link into the meetup group uh, once I have the link. Any more questions for Matt? If you had to pick a reactive framework in either Scala or Java, which would you choose? So which ones are you talking about with Scala? Like Play Framework or uh, Akka? Or? Well, I was mainly talking about Akka because isn't Akka sort of what Play is built on? But I was like, Akka, Vertex, uh, Reactor, there are just so many different choices right now. Yeah, I really like what uh, the Quarkus team has done with uh, Vertex and uh, integrating that. I think uh, the developer experience is, is fantastic, right? Like you can start things up very quickly. And unlike Spring Boot or even Micronaut, like you save a file and it's smart enough to detect and recompile and refresh. And Spring Boot has Spring Boot dev tools, but they require you to compile it before it like refreshes everything. So. I love the Quarkus development experience. Um, as far as the blueprints that are Quarkus or Micronaut, they don't actually have reactive support yet. 
Um, but we're a sponsor, so I'll put some money on and try to get them. Um, the web flex stuff was, was difficult to get my head around. A lot of the other J hipster members did a lot of that work, um, you know, with all the, uh, the streaming and stuff. So, um, I did dive into Scala a long time ago. It was probably eight years ago. And it was the first time in my career, my degrees are in Russian international business and finance. Like I was completely self-taught with this whole programming thing. And, uh, and learning Scala was the first time that I had to learn like math in my career. And so it was a great experience, but it was also like, holy cow, this is a lot harder programming language than others. So I'm still partial to Java. I really like Kotlin, but you know, Kotlin and Java are pretty much the same thing. It's not framework specific. So um, I do have friends that are Scala fans and love it to no end. James Ward is one of them. Daniel De La Hosa is another one, but I'm still Java and Kotlin kind of thing. Nice, thanks. Anyone else? Or I hand it over to Ted now, but he can just take it, right? Uh, yeah, if there's no more questions, then I'll, I'll stop the recording here. Uh, Matt, Matt, real quick. Do you have anything yeah. that you have as a presentation on Quarkus? Because I like the po whole polyglot idea that is being put forward with this type of Gravel VM behind the scenes and how you can use it even on NPM or almost any language. Right, so Graal VM, um, I'm just gonna post this into the chat here for everyone. We do have a post on jhipster Quarkus. We also have one on Micronaut, but uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with what you're talking about. You're talking about Graal VM and native images. So this blog post I just posted, uh, the jhipster version of Quarkus or the blueprint does have Graal VM support and so, when they added it, I was like, come on, why don't we have it in Micronaut? Why don't we have it in Spring Boot? The Spring Boot support has been experimental up until like 2.4, which just came out in December. And uh, I love the whole idea of native and the whole idea that you can start things in like a second or two, but uh, or milliseconds, right? Like not even a second. Um, but the problem is like the developer experience, you're not going to do that all the time, right? You're going to develop on the JVM. And then when you're ready to go to production or create that native build, you'll wait the 20 minutes to do it. And so uh, with jhipster, like I said, Quarkus native builds are supported with GraalVM. Uh, Spring Boot supports native builds now, um, and we've been trying to get it to work, but we have so many third-party libraries and so many open source things going on that there's weird stuff like Liquibase that doesn't work or something like that. So um, we're really close on that. that. They're trying to stamp out uh, uh, basically uh, uh, I can't remember the library. It's the way you do reflection inside of Java. And they're trying to stamp that way out. There's a way to get around it, but the cost to actually put configuration files into Quarkus to work it out so that you're not using reflection is, oh, so onerous. And therefore, that's why I want to see if would someone put a presentation, you know, a presentation together to show like uh, something like uh, JVM and uh, JavaScripts and everything. And I want to see something like that. It would be great because I like your thoughts. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks for the idea. Okay, anything else? Ask away. I got a full beer here. I can be here all night. We do have a question from Starlet. She's looking for an apprenticeship if anyone's hiring. So reach out to her there, Starlet Plumber. Okay. 